Good afternoon. My name is Sebastian Vestergren, and I'm the sales manager for Poland here at Montel. Um, here with me is uh, Marcin Kainski, uh, our correspondent for Poland, covering the Polish energy markets. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction, Sebastian. Um, uh, actually, uh, as you said, Montel's correspondent in Poland, uh, keeping an eye on uh, the market developments uh, here. And uh, I will have a pleasure of uh, asking questions uh, to our speakers, and I also encourage all of you to uh, to pass your own questions, which I would just uh, pass them to our speakers. Yes, and uh, we would like to welcome you all uh, to the Market Insights Poland, um, where we will discuss the latest developments in the Polish power and gas markets in face of unprecedented price surges amid the Russian aggression war in Ukraine. Uh, also, a big thank you to our partners uh, at this event, uh, ABN Amro Clearing, uh, Climate Linkup, uh, EPEX Spot, Phoenix Market Data, Ignitis Polska, Nordpool, and Irgit, who is also sponsoring the networking dinner locally here in Warsaw. Uh, we are going to have four presentations, uh, each of which followed by a Q&A session where you can submit questions via the Q&A section in Zoom. Would you like to introduce the program, Martin? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, first, we will hear uh, how Poland's plan uh, to add gas uh, fired plants will affect wholesale power prices in a mid term perspective uh, uh, by Amber's senior energy and climate data analyst, Paweł Czyżak. Uh, Poland has been planning to fill the gap created by uh, retiring coal, <coughs> sorry, coal fired uh, plants which, with gas units, but uh, um, is it the right choice uh, in the face of uh, tight gas supplies and skyrocketing, skyrocketing uh, prices? Um, and then we, uh, we will have energy consultant uh, Bartosz Polczyński of NRAs, uh, who is going to share uh, his views on power price cap laws, impact on the markets and players. Uh, the law has been branded uh, an end to the Polish uh, wholesale power market. Hopefully, Bartosz will uh, share some optimism with us. Uh, uh, followed will be a 20 minutes break, uh, after which we will have Łukasz Dębski uh, with Ignitis speaking on the prospects of uh, a gas market in Poland, uh, specifically uh, creation of a regional gas hub, which has long been in plans, but uh, will they come to fruition? Uh, and uh, uh, adding cross-border capacity enough to attract players and create uh, a liquid market uh, with a credible price. Uh, last but not least, uh, Irgit's risk manager, Łukasz Grzątka, will speak on how extreme vo volatility, uh, which the markets have uh, seen following Russian aggression towards Ukraine, uh, impact market and clearing house operations. And you, as I said before, you're very much welcome to send us your questions uh, so we can pass them to, to the speakers. Uh, um, and we are hoping for uh, vibrant discussions. Uh, let's start with the first presentation by Pavel Krzyżak. Uh, Pavel, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Marcin. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for the introduction and for welcoming me here. Um, I will share my screen. Um, hopefully, you should be able to see PowerPoint now. Um, does it look okay? Um, yes, very good, Pavel. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, uh, my name is uh, Pavel Czyżak. Um, I'm a senior analyst with Ember. Um, and, and just to give you a very brief um, explanation of what we are, um, Ember is, an, is a global energy think tank. Uh, we are headquartered in, in London and um, we, use, uh, we use data analysis, data visualization to accelerate the, the transition from, uh, from fossil fuels to clean electricity. Um, so we work specifically on the power sector uh, are all, pretty much all around the world. And today I'm going to be talking about Poland's uh, Poland's power sector 
uh, in the midterm perspective. Um, so I will talk a bit about uh, the gas expansion, gas and power expansion, uh, about coal plant uh, closures. Um, then I will uh, discuss renewables and some of the barriers that they are facing in Poland, what the perspectives are for, for uh, renewables development. And then I will touch uh, finally on, on power prices in, a, um, in the upcoming years. So let me just start with a bit of context. I think um, the, the key word that can be used um, to describe what is currently going on in the power markets in Europe, but also of course in Poland, is uh, volatility and risk and uncertainty. Um, these these um, these terms come to mind because of a few um, situations that we're now seeing. So uh, both the very high um, fossil fuel prices, but also a supply crunch. So it's actually not only expensive to buy fossil fuels, but it's not everywhere you can actually uh, secure enough supplies. Then the high inflation, um, the rising cost of capital. Um, are, are causing some uh, uncertainty in terms of uh, long-term investments um, in the energy sector. And then we have market inf interventions happening all the time uh, across Europe. But in Poland, I would say they are, they are uh, quite severe. And, and I know Bart Bartosz will, will be talking more about it, but um, just to mention a few uh, things that are currently happening or have happened already. So we, we, we have changes on the power exchange. It's not certain that the power exchange will survive or will remain as the main place where people actually trade electricity. Um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of uh, um, changes to the tariffs. Um, they are manually steered, but now also tariffs for, for enterprises are being manually uh, controlled. Uh, we have still, we have for the last two years, we've been talking about the restructuring of Poland's power sector and the restructuring of the of the ownership of, of coal plants in Poland. Uh, there's a discussion on ga gas price caps. Um, there's a discussion on, uh, on wholesale prices. And in fact, that's already in motion. Um, so so the, the maximum prices for renewables will hit uh, hit the, the sector hard in terms of uh, new wind and solar investments. Um, so a lot is uh, a lot is going on, um, and it's very hard to actually predict something uh, um, in this this very risky and volatile situation. Um, and I think this chart this chart shows it quite well. Um, these are just the, the uh, gas prices, coal prices, and CO two prices. Um, the, the, the CO2 prices are quite stable, I would say, um, uh, this year and last year, but, but um, you can see that the coal price and the gas price are extremely volatile. So they went up a lot, then they went down a lot. Uh, it's very uh, difficult to say what will happen next year. Um, I will talk a bit about forecasts um, towards the end. Um, but you can see that the volatility itself is a is a huge risk factor. Um, yet, despite that volatility and that huge uncertainty regarding gas supplies, Poland is still planning to to um, build a huge fleet of gas power plants um, and, in fact, uh, increase the the gas power generation. Um, four times, uh, definitely the biggest increase across the EU and a bit on the contrary to, to, to um, the plans of most countries that actually plan uh, on reducing the, their gas, um, gas consumption in the power sector. Um, and this is also because, uh, because gas power uh, generation has been the main contributor to the high electricity prices across Europe. Um, so since, since late, uh, since the second half of, of last year, uh, we've seen a massive increase in whole, wholesale electricity prices in Europe. And this was triggered by the, the increasing gas, um, gas costs. Gas is a price setter in, in many European countries and that, uh, that impacts 
power prices um, in many countries and pretty much across all, all the whole continent because of the uh, common uh, electricity market. So again, even though there are so many questions about using gas and expanding gas in the power sector, um, Poland is still planning and still building a, a new gas, uh, gas fleet. Mm. We, uh, we have a few power plants that, that um, secured capacity contracts. Uh, Dolna Odra that is already in construction, uh, Ostrowenka, Grudziądz, um, the Adamov plant. Um, these are the, the units that already have capacity contracts. Um, and they will, uh, aside from Dolna Odra, the, these capacity contracts start in 2026. So it's not immediately obvious that um, if there are any delays, it will probably be too late um, to cover the capacity gap that we will be facing uh, in terms of coal plant closures. I will come back to that. But I think the most important thing is that, um, again, with the whole uh, very high gas running costs that will that will um, are forecasted to, to remain high for the next years, well, Poland is still building around 10 gigawatts of uh, gas power plants, which is a very um, questionable strategy, I would say. Um, the initial idea for those gas plants was that um, they will replace a gap that is uh, caused by coal plants, um, the domin dominating um, technology used for power generation in Poland. Um, the um, story around coal plants is that um, most of them are uh, currently financed, um, their fixed costs at least are financed by the capacity market. So they get fixed yearly payments for just being there operating. Um, and, um, and these capacity contracts, a lot of them um, end on the um, in the year 2025 because of the EU um, internal electricity market regulation. So around 2025, 2026, we will lose um, about seven gigawatts of coal uh, power plants unless they find a way to finance themselves. Well, of course, at the moment, the wholesale prices are quite high. So um, they, can, uh, they can make a positive margin just on um, selling electricity, um, but um, it's not obvious that th this will be the case going forward. It definitely wasn't the case um, last year and in the previous years uh, where they had negative margins. So uh, we shall see if, if, um, if these plants can secure financing and can remain operating uh, after 2025 without the capacity market funding. Um, there is of course hope. Um, renewables have been growing very quickly in Poland despite some of the policy barriers um, and, um, and they could fill some of the, uh, some of the gap that, that coal will, uh, will create. So um, if we continue to, um, to deploy um, solar, or solar electricity, and if we um, actually accelerate onshore wind deployment, there is a chance we, we will be able to cover some of that capacity crunch um, towards 2025 with renewables. And the current forecasts, um, I would say quite conservative forecasts, um, show that Poland will, uh, will uh, might even exceed 30 gigawatts of uh, renewables uh, by 2025. And we are pretty much on track for 50 gigawatts in 2030. Um, but there are obviously some policy questions around that. So, um, both policy and, and grid access are, are barriers that could slow this down. But in terms of the project pipeline, um, the auction results, auction projects, um, the pipeline is quite strong, especially in terms of solar. Uh, we will probably see a slowdown of prosumer, prosumer solar, but it's very much a question of uh, what will be happening with the tariffs. Uh, they are frozen at the moment, but they, are expected to increase 
So even under the new net billing scheme, uh, solar will be very profitable um, in the, the midterm. So I would expect this is a, for the prosumer solar, this is a forecast by the Institute of Renewable Energy. Um, but I think we might even see a larger prosumer, prosumer solar uptake um, if we continue to see very high electricity tariffs in the upcoming years. And um, this additional capacity will lead to, um, to of course, uh, new uh, generation or higher generation from the renewable energy sources. Um, and the estimate given that capacity increase is that um, renewables could cover a, a third of, of the electricity demand by 2025. And this is quite impressive because um, the current government plan uh, aims for 32, 33% by 2030, so five years later. Um, so we are, despite all the, all the barriers that the government is throwing at renewables, they are still uh, developing quite well, um, again, especially in terms of solar. Um, but this growth can only continue if um, if the policy barriers are lifted, um, especially the, especially the ones around um, around onshore wind, uh, of course the 10h 10h um, setback distance is still pretty much um, pretty much uh, blocking the development of new wind projects in Poland. So um, we the capacity growth that I showed here is thanks to projects that were um, that got permits before or auctions um, secured auction financing before um, sort of the the 10h uh, rule was set in motion but um, but we will probably not exceed around 10 gigawatts of of wind if the 10h rule is not um, amended so that is definitely uh, a key point for uh, for policymakers to be able to um, accelerate res deployment in Poland. Then the second thing is the the um, grid bottleneck. We are seeing uh, a lot of projects being declined um, grid permits, uh, solar utility projects, um, and uh, the grid capacity is definitely declining. So it's quite possible that not all of the projects, the solar projects in the pipeline will be able to secure connection permits and will be able to uh, actually be deployed, which is a huge shame. And of course, that um, that should be addressed um, as soon as possible. And this uh, one more thing about renewables of and again, I, I think Bar Bartosz will be talking about this, but but of course the the well the price cap on on wholesale prices um, for wind and solar um, is a big problem in terms of profitability and we're hearing that some banks are declining um, declining loans for uh, for solar farms um, at the moment because there's this uncertainty around um, how much margin um, renewables projects will be able to generate um, in 2023 and 2024. And this, all of this brings me um, to prices. Again, it's very hard to project anything around prices in Poland, but um, this chart shows roughly how the price was um, generated or how the price set uh, in the previous years. It was set, the, the forward price was set pretty much uh, ideally by the coal running costs. Um, so the variable costs of coal generation, but in 2022, we're definitely seeing an anomaly. Um, so even if you look at the um, European coal prices, um, the price on the forward market was higher than that. It was much closer to the variable, the, the running costs of um, gas, gas power plants, and gas power plants that we don't really have in Poland. So, um, so the wholesale price in Poland was set by gas in, let's say, in Germany and in Europe. Um, and it is very difficult to say if that, because the government is making so many interventions, it's difficult to say if this uh, will be sustained. 
but either way, um, in the midterm, we will see um, the price, the wholesale price in Poland being set um, by either the gas running costs or the coal running costs. Um, and in whichever of these situations, um, the price will be um, around three times higher, at least three times higher than we what we saw last year. So um, if you assume that that after the price was frozen for next year, for the election year, if it comes back to, let's say, its fundamental, um, its fundamentals, um, it will go up a lot. Um, and this is assuming that there's, of, of course, a huge uncertainty in terms of coal uh, prices in Poland, because there now there was a time when they were going up very much towards the ARA price, the European price. The government again stepped in and um, and lowered them, sort of. As, but it's it's difficult to say what the Polish mining companies will uh, will be selling for in the upcoming upcoming years. But it's it's quite likely that they will be um, going for prices that are closer to the European level. So, uh, which will which will impact the power prices a lot. Um, and all of this, uh, the last slide. Um, all of this means that the, the current policies that we see in Poland um, will leave the country as one of the last economies that, that is based on fossil fuels, on gas and coal. Um, Poland will be the last country that has over 50% of fossil fuels in the power mix, which of course will have huge impacts on the economy, on, um, on power prices, on inflation, um, on the competitiveness of, of businesses, um, so going forward, the government should definitely revise that um, that strategy. Um, and uh, I'm cautious of time, so uh, these are just the key messages um, that uh, um, that I will uh, leave you with. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paweł, uh, uh, for your very interesting presentation. Um, can we? Um... Just so pass a question from the floor uh, uh, from Zoe. Uh, please provide the definition of uh, prosumer solar. Uh, should, should I explain that? Yeah. Um, prosumer solar, sorry. Yes. So that is small scale residential solar um, and solar in small businesses. So mostly rooftop installations, but the definition is that it's electricity generated mostly for your own purpose. So that's either for a household or a small business that uses, in theory, at least most of the electricity it, it generates. So it's not a utility farm that sells it to the grid or on the wholesale market. Okay, thanks. And also we have a question from uh, anonymous attendee, uh, are the solar developers with one megawatt uh, I guess under one my god range excused from the price caps um, power price caps I, I assume um, I think I think this was fixed by the government in the latest regulation do, do you know that Pablo? Uh, because there was a... um, yeah I just know there was a last minute change or or it's planned to be changed but maybe Bartosz can low. answer that yeah. later yeah okay um, um sorry um Okay, what do we have here? Uh, sorry, I just I just saw all these questions coming. Uh, how are you? Uh, um, question from uh, from Krzysztof Mazulski. How are you uh, going to secure power supply delivery without fossils? Well, I would say there's a lot of studies that propose a more diversified mix than we have now, so it's not necessarily about securing um, the power, um, peak power demand, because obviously we still have a lot of coal in the system and we will probably, most probably have a lot of gas in the system, but it's also about reducing fossil fuel consumption. So uh, exchanging the generation with, uh, for example, if you add more wind, you can save, for example, more coal um for the winter or you can spend less on gas so it's a matter of diversifying the mix 
Uh, thank you, Pavel. Uh, oh, we also have two more questions. Uh, one is from Tobias Bonhuber. Uh, we see different price trends in Poland compared to the other countries in Central Europe, which are at different levels but parallel. Uh, what do you see as the fundamental reason for this? It's a, it's a very interesting topic. Um, so it's ma mainly the, because of gas. So uh, gas and coal. So in countries like Czechia, um, they they pretty much um, share the prices with the the rest of the European market and and uh, mainly Germany. Um, there's a lot of also a lot of exchange between them, um, and these are set by the gas uh, gas running costs. And in Poland, we pretty much only have gas plants that are uh, used for heating, the combined heat and power plants. So um so they their sort of operating style is um defined by the heat demand not necessarily the power demand and they don't necessarily take part in the, the usual merit order mechanism so that means that they don't really contribute to the price setting uh, in poland and in poland the price is actually set by coal and coal plants so the power price uh, is determined by uh the CO2 costs and the the coal uh, the coal um, the coal cost um, supplied by Polish coal mines, which this year and last year was lower than gas um, gas running costs uh, across Europe. That's why the price in Poland was lower than than um, in the the other countries. But it also went up also because we have trade. Um, because companies can pretty export electricity to Germany, which increases prices, etc. So it also went up, but not as much, just because we don't have so much gas in the power mix. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the next question is connected uh, from uh, from Katri um, uh, Evdokimova. Uh, because you, you said that uh, I'm sorry, I'm not calling you question. Now. Why do you think gas has had influenced? so much the Polish power prices this year. You said uh, coal sets the price. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think if, I, I don't know if we need to um, come back to that. But yeah, it, it, like it, it's also a common shared market, right? So you can, um, if you can sell coal, Polish coal electricity in Germany, at a price that is set by German gas, then naturally it will increase the price in Poland, but um, but in general not not as much. Okay, so uh, so cross border uh, uh, trade uh, uh, is where gas uh, actually sets the price, at, at least for in the spot market market, right? Because forwards are maybe a bit more uh, different uh, in Poland uh, for prices. Uh, sorry. Um, so it's a tricky question about the uh, liquidity of solar corporate PPA market in Poland. I don't. Uh, are, are you are you able to? Uh, did you cover this, uh, Pavel, or or not? Um, really? Yeah, I think to some extent we can also leave some for the for for the other speakers. But uh, I mean the liquidity. I would say it's quite small. I think we have maybe like twenty of these PPAs signed Sign now. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, but they are facing grid issues and they are now facing, the main issue they are, they are now facing is um, is the legislation. I, I think again, Bartosz will be talking about it, but, but the maximum prices, um, I don't know if I should, because it will take a bit of time to explain this. So I'm not sure if, do we want to leave it for later? Um, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I also have a question, uh, Pavel, uh, from me. Uh, so uh, you said Poland is uh, making a, um, a big mistake investing in gas-fired plants, uh, which are actually a lot uh, in progress. Uh, so uh, what, what would you recommend to the Polish government now? Uh, abandon all the construction, all the plants? Uh, how much gas capacity do we actually need at this moment? New capacity of 
Well, it really depends on you could you could go. There are modeling scenarios that show that you could go with just uh, the ones in construction. So like Dolna Odra and maybe Ostrowenka, and awesome. then keep a few. Uh, that's one point four gigawatts for Dolna Odra and seven fifty megawatts for Ostrowenka. So, so, and so then because this is sorry, sorry. And then Grudjans is again 750. Um, so that's like three gigawatts in total. Um, but it, there's a few issues. So the government is building big CCGT plants uh, that are sort of more, um, make more sense if they run a, a, as a base load. Uh, so with a roughly flat profile, which means they also consume a lot of fuel, which is really expensive now. Uh, it would make much more sense to build smaller uh, peaker plants that would just help in balancing. But then you can sort of supply the volume with uh, loads of renewables. And then if you need peak um, peak capacity, you, you turn on the peaker plants. Um, but that would be much cheaper than building these very big CCGTs that are not that much more flexible than, than coal plants. So we could retrofit some of the coal plants and um, they would be pretty much the same as capable as CGTs in, in helping and balancing. In general, we need peak capacity, not the base load one. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the, the whole concept is, is wrong from the beginning. <laughs> um, okay, um, I think uh, we have time for one last question from uh, Hubert Wood. Uh, according to your company, what would be the decrease uh, in gigawatts? Uh, in fossil fuels in 2033 34, uh, mid 2030s, so to say, when first nuclear units will be introduced? Uh, I guess that's the question uh, on how much nuclear will replace uh, of fossil fuels. Mm, uh, it's really very, very hard to say because, like, 2020, 2033, I think it's just one reactor planned or really depends so it's like 1.5 gigawatts or something so it's not a lot and then maybe three gigawatts by 2035 if we are very optimistic so it's not like it will replace a significant portion of um at the at least in the beginning of of the coal plants and they are coming late, right? Because you said we are missing capacity already in 2025. Yeah. Um, also, uh, you, you mentioned the, the distance rule for onshore wind, which is blocking new de developments. Um, does onshore wind has uh, have any chance to replace? Um, I mean, should this, uh, should this uh, distance rule be lifted now? Uh, there is uh, there is a considering uh, considerable time needed to develop new projects, and uh, I was just wondering if if, it, uh, if uh, onshore wind is would be um, able to to replace uh, to step in in 2026 uh, substantially, or 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 is is it just solar uh, what we have at hand now, and some offshore wind? Yeah, so. Um... If we actually go with the 500 meter distance, um, there's instead of the 10H rule, um, there's a few projects, two, three uh, gigawatts of projects that could um, be deployed by 2025 because they are already partially in development. So they, they are sort of ready to being be constructed. Um, if we don't, so that's, that's an optimistic scenario. And, Two, three gigawatts of wind is is quite a lot of electricity. Um, also, in terms of in terms of volume, um, so so that's yeah that 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 could be a, the the contribution. Um, if we if we go if we don't amend the 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 law or if we go with like a higher distance like the, some of the uh, parties are proposing, uh, it's gonna take five seven years to build new wind farms. So then then it's we won't see many um probably be before 2030 so that's a pessimistic scenario and then yeah wind will not help much with the coal uh, situation so i guess we are running out of time uh, to find a solution uh thank you uh pavel and um
uh, we have, uh, sorry, um, just let me check. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, we have uh, uh, Bartosz Polosiński now uh, of Net Trace, um, uh, sharing his views on uh, effects of the uh, recently uh, introduced uh, price cap, um, um, which is which is uh, does have uh, quite a broad spectrum. It's it's a cap on uh, for generators, uh, it's a cap for traders. And uh, and uh, uh, also a cap uh, for retail retail prices. So uh, Bartosz will share his views on on the impact uh, of uh, of market and players. Uh, Bartosz, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, guys, <clears throat> for having me uh, today. Uh, let me let me see if the technical things are we are fine from that. All right, is it fine? Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, okay perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, all right, my name is Bartosz Paluszynski. I'm from NRAs and uh, very nice discussion so far. Many questions you have. So hope uh, after a few words from my side, uh, you will have a little bit more broader view about what's going on in Poland, but uh, um, just to summarize what's going on right now, I would say it's a legislation tornado. So uh, I just want to give you some hints, uh, probably from my experience, the most important ones. Uh, but uh, but I guess there there should be a, a many many question question marks after after my presentation, as uh, as legislation is a really tough thing here in Poland. Uh, last. Uh, last month since last month and i guess it should be a workshop of two or three days with lawyers to cover all that uh, all that issues probably your questions but let me start with a very brief background uh, i don't want to spend too much time back into war etc because that that's obvious i just want to focus on uh, why the caps were introduced um so starting from 2021 from the level of 300 zloty per megawatt hour poland uh from perspective or the calendar 22 or 23 reached the level of as you can see here for 22 in the end of uh, last year um uh, it was a level of 800 zloty per megawatt hour and here uh in uh during summertime we touched the level of uh nearly 3000 zloty per megawatt megawatt hour for for the base load for the for a year ahead contract so really something spectacular if i can use the word like that um you, you also have on this chart uh, marked in in orange the situation of the spot market you see a huge volatility nothing nothing surprising you because all of us know that there is a huge volatility on on the spot market and spot markets so far reached the level of in some days nearly 2000 lot of megawatt hour if you take the average of of the summertime, that was uh, 1,300 lot per megawatt hour for those who were floating on spot. Uh, so we started from there. If we come back to spot, just to give you an idea where where we are, we are at the level of uh, 800 zloty from the perspective of the average price since the beginning of the year, uh, and also the 50 50 day 50 days every moving average. It is also a drawing line at the at the at uh, uh, at the range of 800 zloty per per megawatt hour. Uh, of course, uh, Pavel um, did have his remark about the uh, let's say uh, influence on coal prices to to electricity prices in Poland. That's absolutely uh, correct, and you can see here the correlation is there, but not always. Um, it's especially in the last last week, you see that there is a huge decrease, especially for the year ahead contract for electricity, uh, while the coal prices were were increasing. So uh, you could also be, let's say, uh, catched by those kind of anomalia on the on the poly Polish market. But in general, in general, the coal prices uh, is is very much driving the the, the electricity prices in, in in Poland. So. The energy uh, consumers that I'm supporting them with their with the risk management and they're every day asking me what to do right now, whether to, to do something or not. Of course, uh, there is a many mechanisms introduced um, last month 
uh, I just give you a five of it that uh, to me that there are the more the the, the most uh, important ones. So to start with the uh, carbon balancing market, followed by the carbon electricity final price, followed by the carbon margins uh, from producers from the sellers as well. Carbon prices from renewables at some extent is nothing new from the let's say the, those developers who are in the auction system. Um, but of course, we are touching here the PPAs uh, project as well and the prices uh, that are created there. And of course, we have a cap on the prices in general from the different kind of uh, technologies also uh, touching the fuels, uh, fossil fuels. So I had an idea just to brief you some, some hits uh, about uh, behind all of those. Uh, all of those aspects. Uh, so at least after after the presentation, very short one, you have a, like a uh, let's say the the very brief information what's what's going on here and uh, how to deal with that in in the future and how that regulation could last for 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 how many months or or, or years maybe. The first one, carbon balancing market, uh, hard coal, lignite, and, and gas fire power stations are 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 impacted by that. The law uh, is uh, from the first uh, first uh, October uh, this year till I didn't catch it from the legislation actually. So maybe it is just uh, up and running. So the ministers could change it uh, because of change on the energy market prob probably. And you see here, it's like uh, if you if you go to the to the chart and and the lines that that, that are drawn here, you see that from the very beginning of introduction of the of the cap on the balancing market. There is like a very well. The change is, is obviously visible uh, in in the fence glance. You see there the huge stability of the of the prices on the uh, on the balancing market. I just took the hours from 17 uh, to 18 and from from 20 to 21 like a uh, peak hours. And uh, maybe I will give you my idea as why it could be like like that. The formula itself, it is created like coefficient multiplied by the sum of the portion of the coal taken from, from the Western uh, Europe and the 60% coming from the domestic coal index, uh, which is meaningful. Why it is meaningful? Because uh, we are taking actually the historical prices for the coalish index. So now, right now, the balancing markets uh, price, the balancing market prices are created by by the coal prices, stable coal price coming from October. Yeah, and we are additionally to that we are putting forty percent of the of the actually daily uh, daily values values for um, for for the month ahead contract from from ARA AP two, um, and uh, yeah. So that could have its impact on the uh, on the on the prices here. I I tried to uh, do my own calculations uh, how the the cap is 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 moving uh, at least uh, from uh, from the first first October uh, this year. You see here, and the reaction is just Im immediate. Uh, so next two lines apart from the the cap uh, on the on the on the. Um, Balancing market, which is marked in yellow, you have two other lines. The red one, this is arithmetic, arithmetical average of daily balancing prices, uh, so real real prices, right? Uh, and of, also about spot. So spot is is, is really uh, close to the balancing market, uh, and you see that uh, in, in in most of the cases uh, the cap prices are there. There was a, some some days when uh, the the spot and and the balancing prices uh, crossed the level of the of the cap price, but it was uh, it was um, uh, mostly gener generated because of the uh, involvement of the hydro uh, power station in in Poland, not uh, from the gas on on or, or the coal. Uh, so very very interesting. So interesting also about uh, those companies who are floating on I don't know spot or bal balancing market. Uh, have in their formulas with uh, energy sellers, uh, those kind of formulas, they could at some point, I don't know, predict or try to calculate how the, the spot price uh, could be, could look like in a, in a well, let's say, short future, right? Because in the long, in the long run, it's very difficult to pre predict anything. Um, second, second thing, the cap on the final electricity price, uh, normally small, micro, small and medium companies are 
are benefiting out of out of this uh, this cap uh, 780 ft five slots plus vat and exist tax uh, the mechanism in introduced from the beginning of uh, december so this month uh, but also with some extents it is possible to have a reduction of the of, of the of the price uh, with your energy uh, suppliers uh, back from the first uh, march the 2022 and and it should last by the end of next year so you see here that uh, um, yeah that's that's very interesting the, the, the question if uh, this cap will be i don't know prolonged to 2024 probably depends on the situation on on the market but at least we have uh, some some kind of the, the ceiling what is uh, what is right now for the price for the medium uh, micro and uh, small enterprises, and I was also also asking myself, what is the the impact in the Polish markets? So normally, it's not that huge. Uh, I, I I would say say uh, from the perspective of, uh, of 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 the whether there is no the huge impact of the perspective of the consumption, but you see here the total consumption from the last year it was one seven four uh, terawatt hours and. Uh, uh, industries represent represents about uh, one third uh, of it. So one third of the uh, of the industrial uh, consumers, so the big ones, are not really beneficial beneficials of 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 this kind of price uh, the price cap. Uh, big pity. It's a big ones are representing 0.2 percent of the total uh, total enterprises in 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 Poland. So it's it could be very very small from that perspective. Uh, the beneficials could be beneficials uh, should be a quite range of uh, of of the of the companies. So unfortunately, um, yeah, the cab is introduced for for some uh, some um, and consumers, but for many of uh, of the consumers in Poland, the industrial ones, um, energy intensive businesses, unfortunately, unfortunately not. Um, so what they can do right now? So the, the like the tip uh, for the small and medium enterprises, but also maybe for for some industries, just to have that in mind. Uh, verification of its bank strategies because they they can just float on spot. Why to buy if uh, the the hedge would mean the higher cost higher cost uh, over the, the the cap introduced, or just pick the opportunities because uh, the evaluation of the cap price whether it introduced or not is uh, after demand of delivery. Uh, so uh, yeah, the supply, energy supplier will be evaluating on the on the monthly basis, and uh, you can play with that while seeing. Uh, in maybe in 2000, maybe not right, not right now because the prices are very high for the forward products. My maybe during the 2023, if they see some opportunity because of recession, because of the slowing demand, I, I don't know, any, anything can happen in the energy market. Uh, they can use that opportunity just to hedge below the cap so ha they have a better even price than, uh, than, than cap. For industries, yeah, it's very hard time for them. Uh, they really... Every day they can they can ask what to what to do with the with the prices whether to float on spot or buy uh, by uh, for using the the forward products uh, is is huge uncertainty that uh, there but also what it costs uh, this legislation I, I I guess there is a huge push towards the energy sellers because they can. Uh, think in a way whether we will be rewarded really we're rewarded 100 percent for the uh, for for the let's say support for those small micro small and medium enterprises because again the law it is uh, describing some kind of the formula uh, the formula touches the, the the daily more monthly prices of uh, after the month of delivery so again there is uncertainty what they really the the, the whole uh, cost will be rewarded right so that's uh, also that could impact for the others, I don't know if they can put some extra margins because of that fact, just to cover with the big players some potential lose of on the on the other sector. Cap on producers and sales companies margin. So again, uh, it was uh, it was discussed. Uh, Pavel was talking about about the margins cap. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, so because of the the, the huge potential. 
uh, margin that uh, gas and uh, uh, and coal uh, fire power producers are, are generating. The government uh, discovered some kind of cap uh, for them, uh, for for producers and sales companies. Um, so it was introduced uh, a month ago, and again there is a pattern how to uh, there are different patterns how to calculate that, how to how to measure that. For example, for en energy producers. There is a 3% of the sum of 80% of the day ahead market uh, and the 20% 20 uh, 20 of the day ahead, uh, they had in a peak. So previous in the base and the 20% of the, of, of the peak for sales companies. And again, there is a differentiation whether they are just trading or they are selling the electricity to the end consumers. If they are trading the daily weighted average price multiplied by uh, 1.5% or 1%, depending on for, for whom, et cetera. And for uh, uh, end consumers, they are calculated by daily weighted average price um, and uh, multiplied by the 3% or 3.5%. Uh, so you can imagine that, uh, uh, that's if we are having right now kind of 1,000 lot per megawatt hour, so they're profit margin from from selling that could be around uh, 34 40 slot uh, per megawatt hour this uh, this intervention the another one uh, cap on the prices from the fossil uh, fossil fuels um, so again electricity producers and the electricity sales companies are are impacted because of uh, that and uh, the windfall windfall tax that the European Commission introduced not only to Poland but also other other European countries. So we have that quite same approach here in the in the in the country. And for the different technologies, there is uh, introduction of the uh, maximum price uh, cap uh, on for 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 that. Uh, again, law introduced uh, a month month ago. Uh, so just to give you some ideas how it is calculated and what it is not really uh, easy to determine determine that so i put just two examples of it so price cap for producers from for example coal origin so you have the fuel cost plus transports there is also uh, the co2 co2 cost and the emission factor or the given uh, coal powered fire stations and uh, there is efficiency, of course, included, and also some the margin that were that were discussed just just before that that slide. And they are they are also providing uh, mean meaning the, the the law is also providing the 50 slot per megawatt hour as a let's say some additional factor. I can I can put it like uh, like this. Um, Price cap for sellers for end consumers is designed in a way like the the price of the electricity sold given day, multiplied by the by the margin uh, they are generated, caps to three or three point five percent, and uh, additionally to that there is a uh, added property rights prices so it's uh, like a pass through, um, yeah by, by the law uh, the, the it's it should be also there. Um, cap cap on the prices from renewables and i think there's a lot of discussion um it's it's kind of controversial i would i would say how to interpret it, that um so normally developers uh, the green producers will be also uh thinking about uh, about how to interpret the they, their contracts already signed with the uh, with the consumers as uh, as as also uh, was discussed before my presentation there are banks not not really uh, easy right now to get the financing from the bank right, right now because they could think think in a way if this law will be prolonged again that creates longer term uncertainty to the uh, to the to to the market uh, whether the PPA is something that is still profitable or or, or not. So um, a couple of caps, uh, nothing new. As uh, as I started the presentation, the from the the, the developers who won the auction, uh, just I put the two uh, quite interesting from your side. Um, technologies wind more than one megawatts and uh, PV installations more than meg megawatts. So you have uh, in in November or late October uh, there was a uh, law introduced that are 
capping the price 295 per megawatt hour for wind and 355 for, uh, for photovoltaics. There was a question before that if uh, below one megawatt um, um, installations are exempted from, from this cap on price from renewables, yes. From from uh, what I would observed, what I read in the in the law, uh, those smaller installations, smaller than uh, uh, than the one megawatts, are are exempted from uh, from from that uh, from that law from the windfall tax. And uh, cap price for electricity producers with virtual PPA, and you can also think about think about probably maybe your your uh, physical PPAs existing uh, existing ones. So I guess for the physical ones, there is a huge uncertainty how to how to interpret that. Um, well, my my own opinion that's of course something to be to be checked by the own the contracts etc with with, uh, with uh, your legal advisors. But uh, I guess that that could uh, have uh, influence uh, in the in the windfall windfall tax because that could be the subject of the windfall tax because. Yeah, the, the the PPA price is directly hidden in the in your formula with the physical supply. So if I re, re, read cor correctly the the law, it, there could be the impact and the subject for the windfall tax. Unfortunately, uh, if there is a producer producers with the virtual PPAs, and again uh, two different scenarios that I brought uh, just before. There is uh, information in the in the documents that there is a technology that the price cap for the given technology uh, plus the claim due to the off taker, right? So probably the virtual PPAs should be should be fine, but again this this should be checked by uh, by your your uh, situation. Uh, a lot of uncertainty, I I, I would say. So um, my my big question mark would be if that law will be prolonged for 2024 to 25, etc. Because that really creates uncertainty in the Polish uh, Polish market. Um, but I believe it's it's not really right now to answer because we need to see if the winter uh, will be strong or not, how the situation in the prices will look like. It, it's really something unpredictable right now, and I will be really prudent of of uh, taking some, I don't know, some information gr for granted that it will be like this or, or this. I, I think like right now, a uh, month ago, the, the law uh, was introduced and put additional factors to the to the energy, whole energy market. I really uh, can have right now the hopes uh, that uh, the market itself will, will survive uh, because Paolo also touched the uh, touch the topic of the changes on the on the TGE on the po Polish power exchange. That is a bit of question mark whether the TGE will be uh, again the the good benchmark for the Polish market because we don't have from the beginning of this month the obligation uh, to to sell um, electricity produced through the power exchange. Um, well, by the end by the end of November, we did we didn't have actually, in fact, 100% that was commonly used. We had 100% yes, but there was a lot of a lot of exemptions from that 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 uh, law. That uh, I could say that something like uh, 45, 50% uh, was uh, all the generation were, was was uh, going through the power exchange. So again, the huge question mark: how to how to Deal with all those those changes that I that I brought brought here. Uh, if we don't have uh, like the index, for example, right? How to deal with uh, that volatility? If we have uncertainty about the Polish power exchange, but I really believe and I really hope that uh, this uh, will not be the case. That the Polish power exchange will will survive. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, for now, uh, I'm I'm done. Um. <clears throat> Thank you, Bartosz, uh, for uh, giving us uh, um, uh, a synthesis of these uh, complex issues. Uh, so uh, uh, you say it's too early to uh, uh, to, to see impact on the wholesale market, but I, I, I think uh, volumes uh, are down this uh, this month. Uh, is it true? On the G. Well, in, in TGN, depending depending on the, what kind of products you're looking at, if you're looking at the the forward product, then for example, if we take the the 
the calendar calendar year product uh, the volatility is, volatility is quite poor uh, but uh, shorter we go the, the higher volatility it is so i see that there is a lot of i would say appetite for the energy buyers to to go uh, in the shorter product to even float on spots uh, because simply and probably they they can accept the current price level especially uh, the industrials right because for those who are capped they could not do anything yeah but, uh, i was uh, i was going to ask you about heavy users which uh, don't uh, enjoy heavy power users they don't enjoy any cap right there is a lot of companies who are not uh, not having the cap and <clears throat> they need to deal with this uh, volatility on the polish market like uh, a week ago um with a cold price increase um for the cold price increase because of the cold weather not wind conditions etc etc suddenly we had like a 400 lot per megawatt hour drop in the electricity prices so if if i were an energy consumer i could also ask myself what's going on what's going on guys yeah it's, it's something really strange uh and it's it happens right so the very small volumes for the longer forward periods are determining the the the, the price uh, and this for many end consumers is a really big question mark how to interpret the situation uh, do you think the, the strategy <coughs> strategy of the heavy users would be uh, buying on spot market because you said forwards are pretty expensive at the moment uh, it it really depends. I would say there is there is no. I I'm I was really having uh, some discussions in in the morning about that whether to to spot is uh, is better or what is better for or spot is is really uh, there is no the pattern, right? So all the all the individuals and the, all the consumers need to think about their strategy. They need to understand how what is the impact of their energy cost to the, to their to their, I don't know, profitability for uh, if, if they are able to transfer the energy costs to the uh, to their their their, for example, um, uh, customers, right? Because this could also be uh, some like a comfort if you are able to pass through the electricity costs. What to do? We can float on spot and uh, or discuss with my customer what to do with this volatility. So normally there is no the answer. There were there were in the past the years when the spot was uh, much better than the forward and the, the vice versa. There was a situation completely opposite, uh, like the forward products were were giving you a great stability, uh, like 2022, like two years ago, right? If you hatched. Uh, in, in the pandemic time, there was a, let's say, a huge crisis also from the electricity price perspective and the prices were really low. If you had that time, you're sleeping well today because you had uh, established very nice, very nice price level for your, for your, for your business. Um, so, but also this decision should come from the very good understanding of your, of your own companies and, uh, uh, and I think the connection of the energy costs to your to your different elements of your business. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the uh, to the question from attendees now. Um, uh, so uh, there's a question from Peter Thompson. Uh, hi, do you know if there are uh, any plans on imposing revenue taxes on trading activities in spot market or intraday trading? Um, I guess it's uh, it's separate from uh, from this margin uh, tax actually because it works like a, ta a tax yes this one percent uh, is, mm -hmm. is actually uh, what is left to the in theory to the to the traders uh, of the of the of the margin please. Uh, um really to, we need to go deep deeply in the in the legislations law i i i think uh, not nothing more more uh, to be added from my side for for the for that moment and i think all the traders are uh, need to be aware of that that price caps whether anything can be changed i agree there is a, a again some low changes uh, being introduced nearly i saw it again uh, i think ye yesterday so that uh, the, there is a legislation uh, again, there is there could be the update of the update of the update of the legislation right now. So anything can happen. It's uh, so changeable law right now. So I can imagine that could be additional exemptions or additional taxes introduced. But I'm not able to say right now. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Uh, there's there's a question from uh, Katri uh, about the Kimova. Uh, sorry, I, I hope I get it right. Uh, is issue of unfair competition? Uh, large companies do not get price cap uh, addressed in Poland. Uh, users, I, I, I recall. Is there any lobbying? Well, I, I guess there there was a huge lobby to to address to more and more more companies, but uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, what happened after the pandemic time, the government also has some, let's say, limited uh, limited cash in the pocket, and uh, and that could be a really uh, impossible to to support all of uh, all of the users. Like for gas right now, um, I have uh, many complaints from my clients who uh, who are actually in, in some cases small and, and and medium enterprises, and they were really expecting also the cap for for gas and also only uh, as as government decided only the households will be having the the price capped at the level of 200 slot per megawatt hour, and unfortunately not 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 other. Not others, and uh, I think there is a lot of complaints about it, but uh, not not heard about any kind of the legal issues against the and the, against the government, etc. And bear in mind what is really important that right now we are in the year of the election, uh, parliament election. Next year it is the parliament election in Poland, and I think that the different decisions could could appear in a weekly weekly basis. So I could. Could be, not be surprised if uh, the government will eventually will come up with some kind of support for for the others, uh, because the, this, the 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 push is is is, is huge from the different corners. Uh, yeah, and and two hundred zloty, as you said, is like forty uh, euro. Forty uh, euro for gas. That's correct yeah, for households. Below TTF price. Um, okay, well, we have another question from Kuba Hitelski. Uh, what is the impact on of these reforms on the labor market in the energy sector in Poland, in your view? Um, not not really a huge idea about that. I'm not uh, not huge legal expert with this area, so uh, can't can't really brief some uh, some 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 ideas to that. Sorry. Okay, so. Um... Um, there's an interesting question from Radomi Rongus. I wonder what motivates the trader, uh, the trade at uh, 1,200 slot per megawatt hour on futures market forwards, I guess. Being aware that this price fairly exceeds both the marginal costs and the revenue cap set for even the most emissive and inefficient units. Uh, well, from the energy consumers' perspective, they are, they know now the ceiling, right? So that's the huge difference that uh, that we didn't have that information. What is the ceiling uh, last year, uh, last two years actually? Like from the beginning of 2021, the prices were actually creating a new, a new one, a new one. The the, the price uh, maximum price level every, every week. So every, all of us were asking ourselves, what is the what is the the, the what is the, the sky is the limit or what is the limit? At least right now we have the limit of 2000, uh, uh, 2000 so let's say six, 2600 slot per megawatt hour. So I think the, the motivation could be okay. I have in mind that uh, the price could reach the level of uh, 3000 slot per megawatt hour. Better to hatch and establish our budget at the level of 1200 1, or 1003 or 400 and to sleep well, swallow that, uh, that pill. And uh, maybe try to establish the, the the better situation, better budgets in the in the uh, in the in the years to come. But uh, but yeah, I agree. Um, but as mentioned before, we don't know the spot market. What would be the spot market? At least right now, uh, one thousand three hundred slot per megawatt hour. The prices reached during the summer, uh, in in August. So I can imagine a situation. Well. We need to come back to the situation of uh, was where was the market in, in that in that moment. There was a no nuclear energy from the from the France, like a, I don't know, 60% out of generation from from the 
uh, from from the nuclears because of the drought, because of the high temperatures in the rivers in the in the waters. Right, there's uh, very hot temperatures uh, everywhere, huge cooling uh, conditions, uh, de demand for cooling. Right, many many other factors. The gas prices, coal prices were 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 flying like uh, flying like a, like a racket. So. Um, if that situation repeats in, uh, in in January, February, because of the I don't know very strong winter uh, winter, and uh, like we had uh, two or three weeks ago, the the combination of no wind and no uh, no um, no solar, right? No electricity from the solar panels. We can imagine that uh, the gas consumption from the storage facilities will very strongly move down. And uh, yeah, there could be the situation that uh, how to how to rescue the the, the electricity grids and the system, how to stabilize that. Uh, we should re rely on the nuclear power stations. We should rely on the uh, on what there is no gas, so problem. There, there is a huge push for for coal uh, on that moment from the hydro and etc. Et the backup fuels generations. So maybe that's the mot motivator motivation to. Uh, to trade and secure the budgets for 1,300. Uh, there are many still and consumers who are don't like to be surprised by the by the prices, right? If, for example, you run the business and you after the month of the delivery of the of the prices, you need to inform your I don't know to your to your tenants or to your uh, internal customer that the, the price is 2,000. And uh, the the previous month you had uh, nine nine hundred uh, zloty per megawatt hour, so more than two times in one month. There could be a very big, big, big like a painful experience for you. So maybe that could be a motivator just to trade and forget about those uh, Q1, for example. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Bartosz. I think we have time or not, for, but there's one uh, one more question I think needs to be addressed. Uh, does it mean that virtual PPA corporate of takers will be unaffected by the cap uh, on prices from renewables? Mm, is, is there, uh, uh, where do you have it? I should uh, repeat again the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Virtual, virtual PPA, I see, I see it, okay. Uh, thank you, Luca, for the question. That means that the virtual PPA corporate of takers will be unaffected by the cap on price from... Um, well, probably, I, I think it could it it could work like that. Better to go to your uh, to to your to your site if you have a signed uh, PPA with uh, uh, with the end consumers uh, with the off taker. Better to uh, to go to the to the uh, to, to to the closest. Um, but I, I guess so from the let's say the first glance yeah. interpretation that the virtual PPA uh, corporate off taker could be unaffected by that. But better to double check it with some legal uh, experts. I also heard that uh, because uh, I've heard that this uh, this cap uh, actually refers to the contract with uh, physical deliveries. But uh, yeah, better check with the lawyers. Uh, thank you, thank you again, Bartosz. And um, welcome. We are, we are having a break now. Right? Yes, yes. So uh, thank you to the first two speakers, to Paweł Czyżak and uh, Bartosz Falusiński. Uh, thank you, Bartosz, for being able to provide this presentation on such short notice. Thank you, guys. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, so now we're going for a short commercial break. Uh, we'll be back here at 15. So um, yeah, see you soon. Nordic heritage is a unique and powerful asset. Innovating power markets is what drives us. We provide seamless and powerful trading solutions. 
simplifying a complex world. Transparent, efficient multi-market trading is key to our customers. We keep things simple. We invest in the future and lead the way. For more than 12 years now, Eagit has been servicing on a daily basis transactions concluded by our customers acting directly or through brokerage houses. We clear all the markets operated by the Polish Power Exchange with spot and forward. This includes some of the largest forward markets for natural gas and electricity in Europe. We also clear trades both intraday and day ahead concluded on the European electricity market. Our operations are based on a modern clearing system. We improve and develop our offering daily, striving to provide the optimal and most beneficial solutions to our clients. Security, timeliness, modernity. Eagit. The energy transition is in full motion. The new industrial revolution is here. Markets are evolving fast to renewable energy trading. Production is moving from grey to green. The shift from off-exchange bilateral trading to on-exchange power markets is happening with growing momentum. ABN Ambro Clearing has pioneered in connecting power markets for over two decades and contributed significantly to the acceleration of the sustainable energy transition. We are the Power Clearing Bank, a true partner for our clients and power exchanges across the globe by unlocking access to existing and upstarting power, gas and carbon allowances markets. Get into North America, Europe, Asia Pacific. We create growth opportunities in global power markets for our clients by providing access to exchanges and offering expert clearing services. Empowering the global energy transition by leading the way to safe and transparent power markets. Be part of the transition to sustainable power markets. We can make a world of difference. Get into power with us. Visit abnamroclearing.com or write to get into power at abnamroclearing.com for more. For more than 12 years now, Eagit has been servicing on a daily basis transactions concluded by our customers acting directly or through brokerage houses. We clear all the markets operated by the Polish Power Exchange, both spot and forward. This includes some of the largest forward markets for natural gas and electricity in Europe. We also clear trades, both intraday and day ahead, concluded on the European electricity market. Our operations are based on a modern clearing system. We improve and develop our offering daily, striving to provide the optimal and most beneficial solutions to our clients. Security, timeliness, modernity. Eagit. For more than 12 years now, Eagit has been servicing on a daily basis transactions concluded by our customers acting directly or through brokerage houses. We clear all the markets operated by the Polish Power Exchange, both spot and forward. This includes some of the largest forward markets for natural gas and electricity in Europe. We also clear trades, both intraday and day ahead, concluded on the European electricity market. Our operations are based on a modern clearing system. We improve and develop our offering daily, striving to provide the optimal and most beneficial solutions to our clients. Security, timeliness, modernity. Eagit.
Yes, welcome back after the short commercial break. Uh, now we're going to start the last part of the event, of the webinar. Uh, the last two speakers will give their presentations. Uh, Martin, would you like to present the first speaker? Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we are having uh, Lukas Demski now with the Gitis speaking on prospects of uh, a gas market in Poland. Uh, Lukas, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, hope uh, yeah, you can hear me and give me a second. Maybe you all uh, could also could also uh, see the presentation. So just give me one second, and uh, that would be great. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, now you should good. also <laughs> see the presentation. So. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So, once again, um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to share uh, my view on Polish gas market with you. So, uh, let me briefly start the presentation. At the very beginning, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Lukas Demski. I worked for Ignisi for the last two years. Previously, for many years, I was working for Polish gas and oil company as a head of portfolio management. And today I will uh, give you a success story of, of Polish gas market, which uh, proudly I can say was uh, part of my achievement. I put some small brick into this uh, Lukas, success. Uh, yeah. Sorry to be interrupting you. Could you please uh, click the button hide uh, on the pop up which shows on your screen? Sure. Fantastic. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, that's briefly introduction of myself. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will today guide you through to, to those achievements uh, which happened and uh, will give you some insight uh, my thoughts how it could, could um, develop in future so the presentation plan looks like as follows first uh, we will look at the definitions then i will show you the um, polish infrastructure development uh, the financial gas market development and at the end uh, we will try to think through about the challenges which are ahead of, uh, of Polish gas market. So I pre prepared some small definition how gas hubs uh, could actually be described. Uh, they are no somehow you know dictionary ones, but uh, in my view, we can say there are three types of gas hubs, a physical one when uh, you know gas is physically exchanged usually it's a place well interconnected with surrounding markets surrounding areas with high level of internal gas consumption or production and with uh, excess of supply you know in a way that if you have more supply than you need then you're actually able to import or export this gas to different areas so this is the physical Gas hub, I think the good example of such physical gas hub is TTF uh, in the uh, Netherlands when you have uh, access to the LNG market, access to the gas fields in North Sea, access to the big consumers like G Germany uh, or, or France. So this is a physical hub. And if you have this physical capa capabilities to, to, to trade gas, of course, the next step usually is the creation of financial uh, gas hubs, so financial market, which allows the market participants to hedge their market exposure to um, to trade, uh, to um, uh, to basically do the business uh, not only the non physical way but on financial as well. And those financial hubs can be described as well. You know, you, you need to have many market participants in in order to trade. You need to have low entry barriers which allows uh, companies to set up their trading business. And last but not the least, you need to have the stable regulatory framework because this gives the credibility to the market uh, and you know, allows um, uh, the players to, to stay there for longer period of time if they know that the law will not change immediately. And uh, last, uh, the balancing one, usually uh, this is the, uh, the, the type of a gas hub when, um, it's it's pretty similar to the physical one, but usually uh, it's something when when you don't have the um, the financial uh, market. So this this gas hub is only used for 
I would say, balancing the surplus or uh, shortage of gas of the surrounding markets. So usually this is a bigger market than the surrounding ones and it's well interconnected and it allows the surrounding, smaller surrounding markets to place their surplus or, or this market allows them to cover the shortages on the very short term, day ahead, etc. So this is the definitions. They are here on purpose. Uh, I needed to just describe it, but uh, then let's, let's just not forget them and we'll go back to them at some point. So... Uh, if we think about the physical gas hub and if you think about the Poland, how it looked like a decade ago. And a decade ago, I started a joint PGNAG, I started the work there, and uh, the situation which was, you know, what, what I uh, saw there is that there was actually no existing gas market, there was no gas traded on its uh, spot exchange or, or, or derivative exchange. There was uh, basically one big supplier. Um, there was a long-term contract with Gazprom. Uh, there were not actually alternative routes of supply. The only small limited gas was important. Uh, limit, limited volume of gas was imported from uh, Germany and Czech Republic. It was definitely not sufficient to cover the demand. Um, there were no alternative interconnections. And uh, well, it didn't look too sexy, to be honest. But uh, what is important that some decision has been already made, some commitments has been done, and this is uh, well. We need to go back to the history. Uh, in the very very beginning, the Gazprom contract was pretty profitable for uh, Poland. The Poland agreed to line down the gas, uh, the Yamal pipeline, and in exchange received a pretty good condition on gas, one of the cheapest in Europe. But in early 2000, things started to change. There was orange revolution in, um, in uh, Ukraine, and uh, then Gazprom started to behave differently, started to limit the supply to Poland, and many problems occurred. And therefore, Polish uh, ruling party at this moment uh, the, the decided uh, that they would like to divert the source of supply. And there was a decision made to build a terminal, LNG terminal in Świnoujście. There was a decision to start changing the way how the Polish-German interconnection looks like, to allow it to physically import gas from Germany, not, not only on virtual way like, like it was in the past, to change the loss of interconnections, to maybe build other interconnections with Lithuania, with Slovakia. And so many, many decisions has been started, many investment products has been started. And this is something which, very, which is very unique in Poland, that the ruling party lost the election, the new uh, the new party came, but they understood how it's important for the Poland and they continued this work, uh, which I'm very happy and very proud of that this in, in this area we could agree internally in Poland and actually do something good. And all those investments were continued and uh, this ended in a situation which is now. And uh, we are not uh, dependent on the one supplier anymore. The long-term contract with Gazprom is ended. There are many alternative supply roads. There are many new interconnections. This year, Baltic Pipe, which connects Poland to the uh, Euro Pipe and then to the North Sea uh, fields, uh, is finished. There is uh, interconnection between Poland and Lithuania, which was finished this year as well. Very recently, Polish-Slovakia interconnection 5 bcm per year quite significant baltic pipe then 10 bcm per year lithuania poland 2 bcm per year all those has been finished this year uh, the germany polish uh, gas link is working on physical uh, direction uh, to poland which was so this is a physical reverse to, to poland which was not possible in the past uh, without flow from russia we have LNG terminal, which is uh, increasing in its capacity. This year is 6.3 BCM, but it will be further uh, increased. Uh, by the next end of next year, it could be more than 8 BCM. Uh, last but not the least, uh, from the couple of years, we have developed the gas market uh, due to some regulatory uh, changes, but uh, not only, the, 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 the actually the, the way how PGN decided to implement those regulatory changes um, result in the way that we have liquid uh, developed uh, gas market 
both spot and uh, derivative, derivative, der, der, derivatives uh, market. So market players can hedge their exposure. But still, we have some entry barriers. And I think one of the biggest entry barriers, uh, which was eased for some time ago, but then it was increased again, is uh, the mandatory storage. It's obvious that uh, for security reason, we need to have the mandatory storage. It's now even more you know, uh, clear uh, when this situation on the, our major supplier, Russia, happened. But uh, it can be done in different ways. And I believe this is quite a big entry barrier to have this storage, um, uh, mandatory storage. And of course, uh, we still have quite limited domestic consumption if you compare to the level of consumption to the neighboring markets. And this is due to the historical, historical reasons, of course, uh, Poland's, Poland is, was a coal dependent. So majority of uh, power was produced in Poland from the coal, not from the gas. And, uh, but like, in previous presentation was mentioned, there is a uh, quite a lot going in the energy infrastructure and uh, power plants, uh, gas, uh, fire power plants, uh, they are under um, development. Some of them are already under construction. So this may change. And if I, if, if, I, uh, if I can show how it could be, how it will be in the, I would say, uh, very new future, well, we may see some, you know, at least regional hub and uh, at least physical one with financial, mar maybe with some uh, financial as well, because there will be a significant increase in domestic consumption. Uh, we have the developed uh, derivatives market. There will be even more supply sources because uh, within the next three years, there will be another um, floating storage well the, another lng terminal but this will be actually floating storage electrification unit in dynsk so 6.1 bcm uh, lng in Świnoujście will be increased to 8.3 and uh, you know there, there, there is a plan to additionally build the interconnection of uh, big capacity with czech republic another 5 bcm so all in all this could lead us to more than 50 bcm import capa cap capacity which is much more than the consumption, which is roughly 18, 19 BCM. So this creates chance that Polish, Poland can be a regional hub supplying surrounding markets, which because it will be you know, connected pretty well, just like we announced the moment we'll, we'll go back to the definition. It will be well interconnected with surrounding markets. It will have higher level in the internal gas consumption, and it will have at least possibility of access of supply from different sources, this creates a chance to, to, to Poland to become a physical gas hub. From financial point of view, this established derivatives market is actually here. And from balancing point of view, well, we as a Poland are much bigger than many of our neighbors gas markets. So uh, Lithuania, Baltics, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, maybe at smaller degrees because they are connected pretty well to the Austrian and German market, but uh, Ukraine, of course, if, if the war finally ends, Poland can be, can be in, it, it's in good geographic well place, but can be also, you know, starts to become uh, a nice regional gas hub. But uh, this is from physical point of view. How from the oh once uh, one more slide uh, uh, in previous presentation we saw um, that a lot of gas capacity is being built and this is uh, uh, print screen from uh, development plan of uh, gas system and uh, this shows you how big will be the impact of these uh, new gas fired capacities and how they see that gas consumption can increase within the next couple of years, it may double basically. Of course, this plan was prepared uh, not very recently. So some assumptions I think could be changed. Nevertheless, if a lot of new gas fired capacity is being built, we most likely will see uh, increase in gas consumption. And this of course is additional factor which can help us to build 
the gas cup, regional gas cup in Poland. So this is physical side. How about the financial? So in Europe, we have, like you see on this map, many regions and many gas hubs. The most important, of course, and the most liquid one is the TTF in the Netherlands. The second one is uh, the German D, which is the combined of former gas pool and uh, NCG. Uh, but uh, there are many places when gas is traded, gas is exchanged between those. So is there is a place for regional hub like uh, like in Poland, I believe it is. Uh, but let's look at the volumes. So to see how these things can increase in a decade, I give you the example, for example, for, for, for German hub. So the volume traded in Germany has, is, is, has increased like 10 times within a decade. And the same story goes from TTF, which was not very liquid hub, to in 2008 and now uh, the, the volume are you know extremely high and uh, those things are changing these are the liquid hubs in europe so uh, i'm presenting you the volumes in terawatt hours just to compare it to the poland which is the next slide so as you can see in poland in the region uh, we are not that big anymore not yet that big we with the total turnover in 2020 was 151 terawatt hours but if we compare to other markets like uh, psv in italy well they were close to us in 2011 2008 but they've this increased significantly so i believe it, and they have actually pretty similar history they were pretty well interconnected but they increased the um, their capacity they interconnected to the azerbaijan uh, and um, if you have the physical capacity options to flow the gas i think the market will follow but this is uh, well this is this just one part of the of the story of course but uh, so yeah poland is not yet a financial hub but if you compare it to the surrounding markets, the Slovakian SVOB, or uh, to the Baltics, or to the Hungarian ones, we are definitely the biggest uh, market in the area with the biggest financial uh, turnover. It means that you know at least the stage to create a regional gas hub in Poland is pretty nice set up, and I think the if regulatory will not uh, create any you know huge barriers this may happen but it's uh, but there are of course some threats ahead and yeah what are the challenges ahead so as was mentioned earlier um, there is a, you know legis legislatory tornado here in poland at the moment uh, due to these uh, very extreme high prices uh, there has been announced that there will be lower level of uh, mandatory gas sales via the exchange, which may influence the uh, level of um, gas traded via the exchange. We have a uh, very important uh, use on the market structure, region AG and Orlen uh, merged. Uh, so the biggest supplier and the biggest consumer uh, are now one company, which of course makes you know uh, chance that the liquidity on the market could be lower due to that fact uh, the gas usage at the moment is uh, dropping significantly due to extremely high prices so this path to increase or to double size of polish market on physical side may not happen if these uh, high extremely high prices continue and we have not solved of course the entry market barriers so uh, there is still mandatory storage and uh, with current pricing it's pretty extremely uh, I would say uh, expensive to company to actually store that gas and it creates a quite a lot of um, problems on uh, liquidity side especially and there are still requirements on cross-border trading licenses which makes you know quite difficult to new participants new market participants to, to enter this market we have uh, legislation for um, 
households, which frozen the gas price for, for households and some other type of uh, customers. We have still regulated prices, uh, tariff prices for uh, some part of customers, which again, um, stops the, the market developments. And we are in pretty crazy times. So there are still plenty of challenges ahead. But all in all, if we look at the where we were a decade ago and when where we are today, I would say I'm pretty optimistic. I believe that the Poland will become a regional gas hub. Maybe it will not happen tomorrow. Maybe it will take another several years. But definitely, this chance is is possible, and that this chance should be you know should be taken we should we should uh, do all the best to, to actually create this regional gas hub because uh, it will be beneficial at the end of the day for Poland so this is more or less what I what I wanted to present today and I believe now it's time for questions um, um, <clears throat> thank you Gash uh, it's a very interesting uh, topic indeed um, because Poland has been planning and talking about uh, creating gas hub for, for quite a long time. Uh, but um, do you think it's possible uh, in a market dominated by one player almost completely? Well, uh, again, uh, this, uh, this was, a, I would say, this was a problem uh, in past basically because this one dominator was uh, having the old supply in their hands and therefore it was it could dictate the prices but if we have all those options on the table if we will not have those big entry barriers i believe many other suppliers can appear on the market yeah uh, because if you have the possibility if you have capacities on the borders if you have uh, open borders basically to the surrounding markets to the North Sea, for example, then I think we may have started some uh, competition on that market. And this, I would say, the biggest supplier may start losing its market share. It actually happened in past, in 2014, uh, when first market opening was in Poland, that uh, there was some ease on the storages uh, obligation in Poland, that if you imported less than 100 million cubic meters per year, that you don't have to store the gas. And then we saw that the competition actually started and a lot of new uh, suppliers came to Poland. But then the, 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 the regulatory stopped it. Uh, they they not allow it to, to do it anymore. But I believe there is a chance that this situation may, may, may be changing. Of course, if you have only one supplier, then gas hub cannot exist. You need to have some competition in the market. So, so the government should allow uh, more competition and uh, like the storage yes. room, for example. Yeah. And um, also, you you mentioned the new cross-border links, uh, but uh, isn't it uh, the case that uh, LNG terminal capacity is fully booked for I don't know 15 years ahead? So. Um, by this dominant player, so um, I'm not not quite sure um, why why is. Uh, um, um, how to uh, how to enhan enhance competition in Poland in, in current situation? Uh, do you think that uh, uh, there will be interest in uh, uh, by foreign players uh, to re-enter Polish market? Uh, um, is it is it big enough or is it transparent enough? Uh... Well, uh, I would say uh, the the LNG terminal. Yes, at the moment those capacities are booked. But, for example, the Baltic pipe is not fully booked. There is still free capacity in that pipeline, and there are players in the uh, North Sea which can book those capacities. Uh, there is interconnection to Lithuania. There will be new terminals in the Baltic region. In Finland, uh, there is Klaipeda, which is not fully booked, uh, which, which has re re uh, regular tenders to, to book the capacity. So I believe there will be alternative road, uh, well, sources of supply at least, or chances to supply. Uh, there will be interconnection to Slovakia. It's already happening, but uh, there will be huge, which allows basically the usage of huge Ukrainian storage, for example, which creates some trading opportunities. Yeah, so we actually happened, uh, we, we saw it this year, 
uh, November when prices collapsed uh, in um, uh, in Poland, in Europe, uh, due to the very mild weather. A lot of capacity uh, was used. The, the link to Slovakia was not able, uh, um, uh, available any, uh, at, the, at the point, but a lot of uh, gas flow was flowing to Ukraine, to the storages in Ukraine, and then uh, went back to Poland uh, in the remaining part of November when prices went up. So I think a lot of options started when you have capacities, when you have options, uh, physical options to, to utilize it. And that, that's, I believe, the traders, if they see the money on the table, they will come. You need to have the incentive to go. And if you see the money, the traders will, will appear. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, there is a question from the, from the audience. Uh, is there any free uh, from uh, Raun Ostasso? Uh, is there any free capacity in storage or everything is still um, booked by local uh, market participants? Uh, it depends on the time frame. On the short term, everything is uh, roughly booked because normally there is a procedure which is in uh, February when you, you know, acquire, but there is a basic action when you can uh, book the capacity. So this for, for the current year, it already happened. But for the coming years, usually there is something available for the market participant to book. And uh, this year it was available. And I, I believe it will be available, of course, not the full capacity because uh, part of this capacity is booked on the longer longer uh, products by uh, by the dominant but still this is possible uh, thank you uh, and there is uh, there's a question from uh, Marek Shota um, will the gas infrastructure development be <coughs> ready to take in future hydrogen or um, will there be a new uh, infrastructure needed uh, to transport hydrogen? Uh, do, you, do you know answer for, for this question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky question, I would say. Uh, well, hydrogen is, I would say, some, some heavy, I would say, uh, very catchy subject at the moment. The Germans are saying that their infrastructure will be ready for, for hydrogen, uh, that they, uh, one of them terminal actually will be ready for importing the hydrogen. The Polish one was at least the, the one in Świnoujście was not prepared to do it in my uh, understanding because it was done several years in past. So I believe to actually prepare it to import the hydrogen, it would have to be somehow um upgraded yeah i'm not sure how it will be the fsru in dansk because it's still under the you know project so uh, maybe this new terminal in dansk will be um, useful to to import hydrogen but i don't know i don't believe it was planned as well to do it at least what i have read about it it was uh, normal floating storage gasification unit and uh, not to specifically prepared to import hydrogen. But things are changing, the situation is changing, so maybe there will be some uh, correction. Who knows? <clears throat> um, thank you, Ukash. I think we need, you don't have any more questions from the audience. So um, we, can, we can move on to, uh, to the last presentation by uh, also Ukash, but John Carr uh, with Irgit, uh, who will. Um, uh, speak on um, how extreme volatility um, uh, impacts market and cleaning house operations. It's, uh, also, an uh, interesting subject in light of uh, collaterals rising. Um, Lukasz, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. And good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Łukasz Grzątka, and today I'm representing uh, ISPA Rozliczeniowa Giełd Towarowych. Um, as you probably uh, are aware, uh, IRGIT is a clearinghouse uh, which is uh, responsible for providing services mainly for uh, gas and electricity uh, markets uh, in Poland. And uh, today, thanks, thanks to the Montal, I have an opportunity uh, to give you a brief presentation about uh, last three years outlook from the perspective of, uh, of the clearing company. Um, 
I have uh, quite a bunch of things uh, to cover in my presentation, so so let's let's move on. As you probably know, um, clearing uh, gives some kind of uh, safety for for the market participants for for the um, stability of of the market. And uh, because of that, uh, most of uh, clearing houses, no matter whether they are uh, ME licensed uh, CCPs or, or, or not, um, we, we all implement um, in our models uh, some sort of, uh, let me say, standard uh, risk management solutions. And some of them are uh, targeting creditworthiness. Uh, and try to set up some uh, cutoff points uh, for clearing members for um, for more riskier companies. And the others, like default fund, uh, are only uh, used uh, in, as a last resort uh, when default of market participant uh, happens. And uh, there is a coincidence with uh, extreme market conditions. Um, and today uh, I will not touch them at all um, because um, I think we have uh, one, one topic which is uh, equally important and uh, um, it was equally important during last year uh, as um, high prices and, uh, and the volatility on the market. And uh, this topic uh, are this topic is uh, simply margins and uh, and its values and uh, specifically i would like to um, to explain that uh, there are two main types of margins that are collected by by each cc ccp or clearing house and basically there is variation margin and and initial margin and uh, briefly uh, briefly explaining uh, variation margin uh, is uh, used uh, to cover uh, existing exposures, um, which appears uh, between you concluded the transaction and uh, the end of the delivery of uh, of the contract, if the contract is uh, with, with the, the delivery. Mm. It is a simple, well-known mechanism. It's like the mark-to-market uh, mechanism, which is uh, in, in the financial markets. Uh, and on the other hand, we have an initial margin, uh, which, uh, which aim is to calculate expected loss uh, between uh, the moment when the clearinghouse knows that the default happens and uh, the final time when the positions are closed, uh, the, the positions of the defaulting uh, clearing member. And uh, initial margin value is usually uh, calculated with uh, some uh, level of probability, um, or, or it is called a confidence, uh, confidence level. And in case of most of clearing companies, uh, we use 99% confidence level, which means uh, basically that um, based on the past observations, historical observations, uh, one of uh, 100 um, price movements uh, in the past uh, could be higher than initial margin value. Um, and I have to underline that uh, it is uh, some kind of approximation, some kind of model, uh, which is based on historical data. And um, I'm sure that some of you um, ask yourself already a question, how this model behave in reality, especially in uh, those very volatile times, uh, and how it performed la last year. And uh, on the graph, uh, I tried to um, show you um, some kind of example of uh, initial margin model, uh, which uh, and, and its performance during uh, during last three years. Um, this model was calculated for uh, the 
CAS base uh, contract for the following year. Uh, and uh, it was calculated uh, with use of um, very standard value at risk class model. Uh, we um, I use simply 99% uh, confidence uh, confidence level and uh, two day uh, position closeout uh, period. Um, what is uh, also important? Um, in our example, uh, initial margin is recalculated once, uh, I suppose, once a month, uh, just to um, make things uh, easier. Um, and on the graph, uh, you can see uh, two, uh, two lines, two, two boundaries. Uh, those are um, that the lower and upper boundary are uh, simple uh, initial margin values reflected uh, on, on the graph. Uh, and uh, every observation that lies between uh, those, uh, those lines uh, are so-called safe observations. So uh, if uh, we will have a, a default uh, of the clearing level of, of market participant, and um, we would have to close the position. Uh, our initial margin would be enough to cover all the losses. In other case, uh, when we have those dots um, higher than upper boundary or lower than the lower boundary, uh, our initial margin is not enough to, to, to cover potential losses. Uh, which means uh, that the default fund uh, have to be have to be used, um, and it's as it seems from from this graph, uh, COVID nineteen uh, has not very uh, big impact on uh, on margin model or its behavior. Uh, it's performed pretty well uh, in this uh, in this period. Um, but uh, the situation changed uh, in um, fourth quarter of 2021, uh, when the first phase of uh, so-called energy crisis uh, hit, uh, hit Polish market. Uh, and uh, in, during this time, as you can see, um, price movements uh, exceeded uh, three or four, even four times uh, the, the margin value, the initial margin value. Uh, and uh, from the market uh, participants po point of view, it was also noticeable because of uh, high margin costs and high uh, payments uh, to, the, to the CCPs. Uh, as you can see, if, uh, as we get more and more data in the model, so as we are going uh, closer to the end of 2022, uh, as we load more and more uh, extreme, uh, um, more, more volatility into our uh, historical data, uh, margins are uh, higher and uh, those boundaries are uh, wider apart. Um, and uh, from, from this slide, uh, you can just spot that uh, simply during last year, initial margin values uh, almost doubled which is uh, some kind of the phenomenon uh, in clearing. And um, please also, also uh, note that uh, during last year, the dispersion of um, single observations uh, from, uh, on this contract uh, were roughly uh, twice as big as it was in the pre-war. Um, pre-war period. And um, almost, uh, almost, uh, this, the, uh, the, almost uh, the same happened to the uh, electricity market. Uh, there is a, a mistake probably on the, uh, on the slide on the uh, upper uh, description, because uh, here we have uh, uh, Mm, a slide uh, with data from uh, electricity base uh, contract for the following year. Uh, and uh, we, we, we see that uh, 
Um, COVID-19 period was uh, much more volatile for, for the electricity market and uh, it was reflected in slightly bigger initial margins uh, after the um, after the, 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 the COVID period. Um, and uh, still um, the fourth quarter of 2021 uh, and uh, the, the year 2022 were pretty much the same as it was uh, in the, the, the gas case. Um, and it was briefly speaking full of um, so-called uh, so-called uh, black swans uh, appearing almost every every single week. Uh, so um, uh, we um, probably all uh, ask ourselves a question. Uh, is it some kind of uh, short term, short, short, uh, short term uh, phenomenon, or maybe uh, it's something uh, something happened to the market that the mar market characteristics changed forever, and the the high volatility uh, will will become the the new normality, uh, and. As a, as a risk manager, manager um, the only thing uh, I know is that higher initial margins uh, uh, will stay with us uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, it's, it's due to the fact that most of clearing houses incorporate those most extreme volatile data uh, in the model or they use uh, very long uh, time series to, uh, to produce initial margin value. Uh, which uh, and and because of that, uh, it, it takes a lot of time to to drop those uh, th those most extreme observations. Um, and the other the, the other thing I'm pretty uh, sure about that uh, this uh, that 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 slide uh, like this uh, with multiple breaches are not the thing uh, I would like to see uh, as a risk manager in the uh, in the nearest future. Um, initial margins uh, are um, probably uh, much more important from the point of view of uh, of clearing house because uh, because the role of the clearing house because uh, the fact that uh, any, uh, any losses uh, above the, 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 the initial margin are covered from the default fund, which uh, uh, includes uh, market participants' money, and nobody wants to, to, to lose uh, money of market, market participants. Uh, but uh, key indicator, uh, key indicator, and the key thing that uh, Market participants uh, would like to know are are, are the um, aggregated uh, values of margins, including uh, variation margin calls. Um, and uh, in contrast, uh, this is for sure not the uh, slide uh, market participants would like to see in the future, uh, because from this slide you, you have a clear evidence. Uh, that uh, last year's, uh, this year's margin values went uh, simply through the roof. Uh, and in most extreme cases, uh, margin aggregated, aggregated margin values uh, required by IRGIT uh, were 20, uh, more than 20 times uh, bigger than the, um, uh, the, the average uh, value of aggregated margin uh, values uh, from 2019. Um, and for sure, the, this impacted uh, greatly uh, market participants, uh, liquidity resources, uh, and uh, for us, it was additional operational stress to uh, to proceed with uh, all all the payments, all uh, non-cash collateral uh, acceptance, and uh, and so on. And interestingly, uh, in last three years, we have only uh, only two defaults. 
in all cases, uh, final losses were, were covered uh, from, the from the resources of a defaulting clearing member. Um, and during uh, this uh, third quarter of uh, 2022, um, during the, those most extreme high prices period, uh, we spot that uh, th that some dangerous processes started uh, on, on the market uh, that could cause uh, even a domino effect on the market, uh, the, the domino of defaults. Um, the, the process uh, which we try to describe on this slide uh, starts with uh, with high uh, high prices and high margin values, which uh, simply cause uh, liquidity squeeze on on market participants, and this usually leads to uh, position closing uh, because uh, market participants. Uh, um, didn't know what what to expect in the future and try to minimize the, their exposure on the market uh, and uh, closing position on on the market uh, co was causing uh, even less market liquidity uh, which translates to to, to higher price uh, volatility and and higher uh, higher margins again uh, so, in in the environment uh, we were working uh, in 2022, um, we were pretty sure that some defaults uh, could happen. To be honest, um, but as you uh, as you may guess, uh, nothing uh, nothing happened. Um, no defaults were indicated uh, on the previous slide. Um, what we observed instead uh, were various steps uh, which were taken by, by the policy makers, uh, by, uh, by, by various uh, po politics. Um, as far as I remember, it was estimated that uh, during uh, this most extreme, most uh, extreme prices period, um, European energy companies, uh, as as a as an industry, uh, faced uh, almost 1.5 trillion euro margin calls aggregated, um, and uh, most of the fin financial aid uh, was given uh, by. Um, by banks and governments uh, and uh, through the, the bank loans, through some uh, government uh, financial guarantees. And uh, what, what happened also is uh, that additionally, um, well-known associations like EFET or, or EACH or Europex and, and the other uh, try to to push or or, or try to convince uh, policymakers, European uh, politics, uh, to provide even more uh, aid to the to the energy uh, market participants, uh, and potentially uh, change uh, the um, change the catalog of eligible collateral that that is accepted by European CCPs because. Um, most of the European markets are, are cleared by EMIR licensed CCP uh, and uh, according to, uh, to some uh, regulations, uh, the, the catalog of the collateral is uh, very limited and uh, what was um, initially uh, proposed is to, to, to add to this catalog uh, EUAs and uh, bank guarantees uh, just to help the, the industry to to face those uh, those um, th those margin calls. Uh, and what is interesting, uh, we as EBIT we are um, accepting bank guarantees uh, as well as uh, EUAs uh, from uh, from almost from from our beginning. And uh, during last year, we saw that this kind of um, collateral could be uh, a decent way to reduce uh, the 
the liquidity squeeze in those most extreme, most volatile uh, moments uh, on the market. But also, um, it, it is uh, very cost uh, cost effective, uh, especially uh, in high interest rate uh, environment. Uh, moreover, what happened uh, in uh, in Poland uh, during uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, were um, some extraordinary um, policy steps that were taken and um, and for the first time in history uh, Irgit uh, was obliged by the law uh, to accept so-called corporate uh, guarantees uh, as a collateral. Uh, it's um, not a standard solution. Uh, and it was very demanding to, 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 to implement it to our, uh, our, our models in a very short, short period of time. Uh, but it happened and initially 50% of uh, margin uh, could be covered with uh, corporate guarantees. Um, but after three months of uh, 2020, uh, that the law expired, uh, and after one year, uh, one year, one, la one year later, in December uh, 2021, uh, the solution was uh, implemented again. Uh, it was due to the energy crisis that that that, uh, that hit the, the European markets uh, before the end of the 2021, um, and. Um, between the December uh, 2021 and today, uh, these solutions were uh, even um, developed by, by the policymakers. And uh, now uh, we are obliged to, to, to accept uh, even 90% of, uh, of margin value uh, in corporate guarantees. Um, and this solution is uh, mainly for uh, investment grade uh, credit rating companies. Um, and as you can see, uh, and as you can see uh, from the from the next slide, uh, when used in um, in the most uh, optimal way. Uh, those corporate guarantees uh, could even reach uh, more than 50% of, uh, of, of the all uh, collateral that is required by, uh, by, by EUBIT. Um, it also, on, on this slide, uh, we also try to, um, try to somehow incorporate uh, subsequent uh, impact of subsequent changes to the law, uh, because as you can see, the, there is a sh so-called shield one, shield two, shield three, and those are uh, the, the the subsequent changes to the law um, reflected or on this graph. <coughs> And they, it was mainly the, the changes that impacted the. the uh, the value of uh, corporate guarantees that could be um, could, could be accepted as as, uh, as a collateral. Um, and from this slide, you just can find out how the collateral mix uh, in Irgit uh, um, changed during uh, during the the last uh, three years. And it also seems to, to me that um, in crucial days uh, with the, the most extreme market uh, movements, um, this kind of, uh, no, uh, let me say, non stardust solution uh, imposed by, by policymakers, uh, which is, to be honest, not very uh, welcome by, by risk managers. Um, mainly due to low liquidity of, of, of such solution. Um, 
really helped help the, the market participants and, and probably protected some of them uh, from being declared in, in default by, by IRGIT uh, and being pushed out from the market and causing even, uh, even more volatile environment. Uh, and, uh, last year was, of course, very um, operationally demanding for us, uh, but uh, to give you some impression what could happen in, in the future, um, because we as an organization, we were taking some additional steps uh, in last uh, year um, to, to become uh, even more attractive, uh, more attractive clearing house. Um, we uh, focused on um, offering some new functionalities from the uh, collateral perspective. Uh, mainly, we focus on margin model optimization, so we uh, will um, probably next year uh, implement interperiod margin offsets. Uh, and uh, what we are also working on is uh, optimization of collateral um, concentration levels, and uh, we are trying to develop some Mm, some new models that will allow us to uh, to accept some mm, additional collateral forms that uh, would be uh, sufficient to, to cover the needs of the market participants. And to wrap up, I hope that um, after this demanding care with extreme extreme uh, volatility, we as IRGIT and probably you as the market participants, uh, we are better prepared for, for, for the future. And uh, I hope that this new year will bring us some, some relief. Um, however, uh, I might uh, be in doubt because uh, um, the other presenters uh, showed that, that the future is not uh, as bright uh, as it seems. And that's all from my side. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ukash, uh, for a very interesting presentation. I think it was very uh, detailed. Uh, we have no questions uh, from audience. Um, so um, uh, I was going to ask you, uh, out of these collaterals uh, that you showed on the slide, uh, that peaked so much uh, uh, this year. Uh, how much is cash positions actually? How, how, how much do you? Uh, is it uh, is it substantial number, or uh, in terms of cost for the for the market players? Um, in in terms of the nominal values, it's substantial, for sure. And uh, if we compare it to the pre-war levels, it's it's something uh, very extraordinary. Um, in the past, uh, there was no time where the cash was uh, in such a big values uh, collected in Yirgit. Okay, so uh, um, this uh, low capping the, the power prices, uh, would it have effect on, on collaterals? Uh... I would like to know that because <laughs> it depends uh, how the market will react that, on, on those uh, low changes. Uh, I think we are living now in a very, um, very demanding uh, time uh, with, uh, with no certainty what will happen in, in the nearest future. And uh, CAP itself is uh, probably not uh, very, um, it, it's, it is not uh, reflected already in, uh, in, the, in the market, in the forward uh, prices. And uh, as, far as, I, as far as I know, um, it has no impact on, 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 on this market. Uh, but who knows? Maybe it will change in, a, in the nearest future. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Uh, at, at the moment, probably nobody. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Gash. <laughs> and uh, I would like also to thank, because we are, we are um, 
uh, nearing the end uh, of the of our webinar. So I would like to uh, thank uh, audience for all the uh, excellent questions, which we ap appreciate a lot. Uh, and of course, speak, uh, our speakers, uh, Pavel Bartosz and Bo Fukas, for uh, sharing their knowledge, knowledge uh, and views with us. Uh, as we all know, uh, we are uh, in uh, a turning point now uh, in so many areas, or maybe there are so many turning points that uh, we are uh, at the same spot uh, as we used to be uh, like 15 years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's extremely important to, uh, to have some uh, insights from experts to, uh, to use their clarification uh, in this uh, demanding uh, circumstances. Uh, I'm, and so I'm uh, hoping this event uh, helped to shed some light uh, upon the latest developments in Poland. Sebastian? Yes, I'd like to also thank the, the audience uh, that there were so many of you uh, who chose to use this afternoon uh, together with us. Um, also uh, for being so active with so many questions. A uh, big thank you to the speakers, uh, Paweł Czyżak, Bartosz Palusiński, Łukasz Dębski and Łukasz Grządka. And also thank you to our partners, um, ABN Amro Tiering, uh, Climate Linkup, IPEX Spot, Phoenix Market Data, Ignitis Polska, Northpool and also Irit. <clears throat> um, we end this webinar. But uh, this evening we have a networking dinner uh, locally here in Warsaw, uh, which is sponsored by IRGIT. Um, for those of you who have not resisted yet and are interested and are in Warsaw, um, you can get in touch with me personally. Um, it, my contact details are on the program uh, website. Uh, so just check there and uh, call me. Um, we're going to be at Zachodni Brzeg, um, this is in the food court uh, Hala Koszyki on uh, Koszykowa Street here in Warsaw. Uh, we start at 19, so uh, if you're interested just uh, let me know and uh, I'm sure you're going to find the room for you as well. So yeah, just to wrap it up, wrap it up um, thank you again and see you next time. See you, thank you. For more than 12 years now, EAGEAT has been servicing on a daily basis transactions concluded by our customers acting directly or through brokerage houses. We clear all the markets operated by the Polish Power Exchange, both spot and forward. This includes some of the largest forward markets for natural gas and electricity in Europe. We also clear trades, both intraday and day ahead, concluded on the European electricity market. Our operations are based on a modern clearing system. We improve and develop our offering daily, striving to provide the optimal and most beneficial solutions to our clients. Security, timeliness, modernity. Eargeet. Heritage is a unique and powerful asset. Innovating power markets is what drives us. We provide seamless and powerful trading solutions, simplifying a complex world. Transparent, efficient multi market trading is key to our customers. We keep things simple, we invest in the future and lead the way. For more than 12 years now, EAGEAT has been servicing on a daily basis transactions concluded by our customers acting directly or through brokerage houses. We clear all the markets operated by the Polish Power Exchange, both spot and forward. 
This includes some of the largest forward markets for natural gas and electricity in Europe. We also clear trades, both intraday and day ahead, concluded on the European electricity market. Our operations are based on a modern clearing system. We improve and develop our offering daily, striving to provide the optimal and most beneficial solutions to our clients. Security, Timeliness, Modernity, Eagit. The energy transition is in full motion. <laughs> For more than 12 years now, Eagit has been servicing on a daily basis transactions concluded